Can you see uh, all? Can all you see my uh, screen? We do see it. Can I start the presentation? Sorry, wait for Sandeep. He is going to introduce a few okay, moderators. We'll wait, and then... Let's wait for 6.30. Uh, like, I think it's just 6.30 now, right? Yeah. Because I think Richard has gone right now. He said that he'll be back at 6.30. Sandeep, do you record the uh, meeting? Or... Yeah, do, we do. All these meetings are on a, a um, YouTube channel, so if you just yeah, yeah, link, yeah. and you can you can. Get. So you asked, and they started recording. <laughs> oh, okay, I think a... start. So uh, I think I welcome all of you to the fourth session of uh, how I do it. So today we will have three speakers, uh, and before that, Dr. Aman will uh, speak on the anatomy of the thoracic spine. So our three moderators are Dr. Hin Seng Kim from Korea, Dr. Judy Patipan from India, and Dr. Girish Tai from Australia. So I invite Dr. Kaman to start the first talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sandeep. Uh, today I am going to uh, present the uh, topic on anatomy of thoracic spine. So let's start my presentation. So the contents uh, of my presentation will be uh, introduction to the thoracic spine and the osseous structures and ligaments. Basically, the thoracic uh, part of the spine consists of 12 vertebrae and uh, it is uh, kyphotic in curvature. And this uh, is also called primary curve because it is present at birth. And the kyphotic angle range from 20 to 50 degrees. Uh, in this diagram, we can see a fetus and an adult. Uh, we can appreciate a single curve in the fetus. So uh, we can appreciate uh, the dots, the green, uh, uh, the blue, and the uh, purple color are the thoracic and the sacral, uh, which are present. And by uh, at the at the fetal line, so uh, the cervical and the lumbar curves uh, they develop later in the life uh, when the child starts uh, sitting and starts to hold the leg. So why it is necessary to be uh, for the spine uh, to, uh, to uh, for the spine so it it becomes because the curved spines helps to maintain balance in upright position and it increases the strength of the spine. It also uh, helps in absorption, shock absorption and it protects the vertebra from any uh, injury and fracture. This, uh, we can divide the thoracic and lumbar region into a, three biomechanical zones. And the first, it ranges from uh, T1 down to the T8. It is a, a relatively rigid part uh, because of attachment uh, of the rib cage. And uh, the curve is uh, here, it's a kind of thick. And uh, due to this, most type of friction injuries uh, predominates, uh, predominates here in this region. And the second region, it uh, uh, starts from T9 down to the L2. It is a transitional uh, zone uh, between the um, mobile and the immobile zone. And uh, the angle is also uh, is transition between the kyphotic and the um, lordotic uh, curves. And uh, it is a uh, uh, most type of injuries occur here because of the, uh, the its transition between the rigid and the mobile part of the uh, spine. And the third region uh, is the uh, starts from L3 and down to the sacrum. It's mobile part. And most of the uh, axial type of injuries predominate in this region of the spine. 
now we will discuss the kinetics of the spine and the flexion extensions are more limited in the upper thoracic region and the flexion uh, ranges from 20 to 45 degrees and the extension ranges from 20 to 45 degrees while the lateral flexion increases in the lower thoracic region and it ranges from 20 to uh, 40 degrees rotation is more limited in the lower thoracic region and uh, it ranges from 35 to 50 degrees in each direction Uh, in this diagram, uh, we can appreciate there is a gradual change uh, in the shape of the uh, vertebral bodies from uh, cervical down to the sacrum. There is a gradual increase in the height and cross sectional area of the vertebral bodies and uh, reaches uh, to maximum at the lumbar uh, region in the cross sectional area. The, this is due to the increased load uh, bearing from a cervical down to the uh, sacrum. Later on, we will discuss uh, with the increase in the cross sectional area of the vertebral body and this uh, uh, cross sectional area, uh, the compression strength of, of the uh, region increases. Now, what is a cur um, curved uh, 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 balance curve? A balance curve is defined as when uh, we draw a line from C7 uh, down to the sacrum. And this line should be at the uh, L5, S1, five, uh, L, this, uh, posterior disc uh, margin. Any deviation from this, uh, uh, this line uh, is uh, uh, uncurved. Uh, is, uh, uh, any division from this uh, line uh, is unfavorable. It will lead to increased stress on the, um, uh, the joints, the ligaments, and the disc spaces uh, will start degenerative processes, uh, which will manifest in the form of different spinal uh, degenerative diseases. This is a gram uh, diagrammatic uh, representation. Uh, in, uh, we can appreciate uh, from the cycle down to the uh, lumbar region, there is a gradual uh, increase in the um, height and cross sectional area uh, uh, of the vertebral body. So, with the increase in the cross sectional area and height of the body, the compression strength also increases proportionally. And this compression strength peaks at two points at the level of uh, the uh, lumbar junction and at the level of the L3. Uh, and L, uh, L4 and L5 level. Now we uh, uh, will uh, discuss the shape of the um, thoracic um, uh, vertebrae. In cross sectional area, we can see the vertebral body is a uh, heart shape, the canal is almost circular, the um, lamina is uh, and the lamina and the uh, the transverse process are situated uh, dorsally as compared to the facet joints and the, as compared to the lumbar spine, uh, the lumbar vertebrae uh, is uh, kidney shaped, the canal is uh, oval and the transverse process and are directed laterally as compared to the thoracic spine and the spinous process directs uh, almost horizontally as compared to the thoracic spine which Slants at an elevation about 40, uh, 30 to 40 degrees downward in our central plane. On sexual view, we can see uh, it is a uh, the body of the thoracic spine is wedge shaped. The dorsal height is more as compared to the ventral height. So uh, combine when these combine, they provide a um, Kyphotic curvature uh, to the thoracic region as compared to the um, lumbar uh, vertebra having the short uh, dorsal height as compared to the ventral height. So, the, this provides a lordosis to the lumbar region. Along with this, we can appreciate a uh, feel of the demi facets along the lateral surfaces of the vertebral uh, body and a facet on the dorsal, uh, the transverse process, which articulates with the uh, ribs 
of unlikely number density. Now we will discuss certain features of thoracic vertebra. Uh, th typical thoracic vertebra have a body um, pair of uh, superior articular facet and inferior articular facet, the, the transverse process and the spinous process, and the facet, articular facet for uh, on the transfer, uh, transverse process for, the, for articulation with the uh, ribs. Um, the atypical vertebra uh, can, um, the constitute T from T1, T9, T10, T11, and T12 are atypical vertebra because certain of these features are missing. So we will uh, discuss one by one these features. This is T1, uh, the vertebra. We can see there is only a one tiny facet uh, on the lateral surface which articulates with the first rib. And the transverse process is horizontal, almost horizontal, and it's similar to the uh, spinous process of the C7 vertebra. The T10, T9, uh, T11, uh, and T12 have a single demifacet that articulates with the likely numbered, uh, likely numbered ribs. The T10 have no direct articulation of with the uh, 11th rib and uh, the, the transverse process of the uh, T11 uh, and T12 have no articulation with the lightly numbered rib. Now we'll uh, discuss the intervertebral disc. The intervertebral disc uh, makes up to 20 to 30 percent of the total spine length. The size increases from cervical down to the lumbar region. The ratio between disc thickness and vertebral height is greatest in cervical and lumbar region. So the greater the ratio, the greater the mobility of the region. The function of the uh, disc is basically uh, to uh, accommodate compressive loads, which is the function of the uh, nucleus purposes and to resist tensile and torsional uh, strength, which is the uh, function of the annulus uh, fibrosis. Now, uh, in this uh, diagram, we can appreciate both the nucleus fibrosis and uh, nucleus uh, annulus fibrosis. The nucleus fibrosis basically is, it is a semi fluted like substance embedded in a network of fibrous string. And while the Mm -hmm. Annulus fibrosis is made of, of um, less uh, fibrous strains and fibers, and uh, we can see there is a um, uh, we can divide it into the inner part and the outer part. The inner in the inner part, the fibers are loosely arranged, while uh, the fibers are uh, in the outer portion they are more uh, more regularly arranged, and the strength also increases as we go from the inner to the outer uh, part of the nucleus fibrosis. The outermost fibers are also known as the Sharpies fibers, and these are the toughest fibers. And these fibers uh, have a attachments uh, and the penetration into the uh, adjacent ink plates. And uh, literally, uh, these, uh, uh, it blends with the uh, periosteum and the other ligam uh, the ligaments of the uh, spine. Now we will see, uh, we, uh, discuss uh, the um, in plates. Basically, the in plate uh, uh, is divided into a central um, concave part and the peripheral raised uh, and the uh, ring part known as the apophysic ring. Uh, the centrally uh, depressed or uh, the concave part is made up of cancerous bone, and while the uh, raised rich part, uh, known as the apophysic ring, is made up of cortical bone. And this is the uh, um, strongest part of the uh, end uh, plate and um, resists most of the compressional uh, failure. Uh, from this diagram, we will understand the mechanism of the uh, disc. So, uh, the annulus fibrosis, it acts like a coiled spring. It uh, 
absorb the uh, forces uh, down uh, uh, the spine while the uh, nucleus process acts as a bile bearing that uh, uh, on which the vertebra uh, roll over during flexion and extension and other movements. Uh, in this uh, MRI, uh, we uh, see uh, the position of the nucleus uh, process gradually transferred from the anterior to the uh, from the posterior to the anterior uh, part. Uh, it is because the nature of the curvature uh, the, and the force that acts at the, uh, on the dorsal thoracic part and at the lumbar part. The, there is a gradual shift of the nucleus process from uh, the dorsal to ventral part of the spine. So the stress on the, uh, the disc space is highest at the dorsal part as compared to the ventral part. That is why the, the most of the disc herniation occur uh, at the dorsal part rather than in general. Now we uh, discuss the um, uh, pedicles. The pedicles in the our upper thoracic spine, the upper line, it almost be lie uh, in line with the uh, upper vertebral margin. While the um, lower, uh, in the lower part of the um, upper thoracic spine, they meet at the mid vertebral margin. So if we uh, perfectly uh, go down uh, in the toward the thoracic spine, down into the thoracic spine, this high, the height of the uh, particle in increases. So in the, at the level of the D12 and D11, it's uh, almost the completely uh, corresponds to the vertebral uh, body. The transverse uh, uh, pedicle width is uh, uh, more uh, important while uh, putting a screws in the thoracic spine. The pedicle height, uh, the, the pedicle width, it's uh, uh, gradually decreases from T1 down to the T4 uh, 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 and T5, T6 level, and then it again the width uh, again increases from T6 down to the T12 level. Which are uh, diagrammatically show the uh, change, the gradual change in the transverse vertical bit. The uh, entry point of the thoracic spine is uh, uh, quite variable as uh, compared to the uh, in lumbar uh, region. So while putting the screws in thoracic region, it is necessary uh, to remember by putting the source in the T1, T2, T3, T12, in coordination, it is uh, used the midpoint of the T2. While uh, for T7, T8, and T9, use the top of the uh, line of the. While in the medial lateral angle, medial lateral angle for T1, T2, T3, it is even uh, just lateral uh, to the lateral edge of the uh, pass, while for T7, 8, and 9, it is just lateral to mid portion of base of superior articular portion, just lateral to mid portion of the base of the uh, articular portion. Uh, in this diagram, uh, we uh, can see uh, the, diff uh, the and different entry points uh, for a particular screw fixation, uh, we can uh, see it with continuously, uh, progressively, there is a change in the entry points. And we, in this, we can see the diameter, the transverse diameter of the pedicle from T7 down to the uh, T12 level. The pedicle diameter of width, it is uh, almost 8 mm at the level of the T1 and 7 at the level of T2, it is gradually decreases up to the level of uh, T4. And then it is uh, at T4 up to the T6, T6 it's uh, almost the most uh, 5 in uh, width. And then 
from T7 down to the T12, it again uh, increase the width increases gradually. That is uh, almost uh, 7 mm at the uh, level of the T12. So if we see the diameter is uh, more at the level of T1 and at the level of the T11 and T12. The angulation also uh, decreases from T1 down to the uh, T12. It is uh, highest at the level of T1, ranging up to 27 degree. And it is zero or minus at the level of uh, T11 and at the level of the T12. No, uh, this is a uh, di uh, diagrammatic representation uh, showing the transverse pedicle width and the height of the pedicle. Uh, we can uh, uh, see there is a gradual increase in the width of the uh, pedicle from cervical down to the lumbar region. And uh, also the height of the pedicle uh, also uh, increases from cervic uh, cervical down to the thoracic uh, region. Uh, I already discussed the different angulation uh, previously, so I am skipping this uh, diagram. Now we uh, discuss the uh, facets. The facet joint, basically the facet joint uh, is formed by the superior uh, articular process of the vertebra below and the inferior articular facet of the vertebra above. And it is well encapsulated joint and it's a signable type of joint. The capsule provides the maximum strength to the uh, joint and it is uh, formed by two layers, the inner layer and the outer layer. The um, inner layer, uh, the outer layer is made of uh, parallel collagen fibers, while the inner layer is uh, made of elastic and it is more uh, elastic as compared to the outer layer. Uh, in this diagram, we uh, can see the orientation of the facet joint in the cervical, the thoracic, and the region. In the uh, in the frontal and the transverse plane, in the cervical region, the um, the, the facet joints lie zero uh, transverse or zero depth, make us zero angle with uh, um, in transverse plane and forms of the orientation in the frontal plane is at 45 degree in the cervical region. While uh, in the thoracic region, they make a 20 degree uh, uh, according to the transverse plane, while make a um, 60 degree along the frontal plane. In the lumbar region, the um, orientation of the facet joint is 45 degree uh, along the, in the transverse plane, while it is uh, oriented 90 degree in the uh, frontal plane. Uh, in this diagram, we can see the orientation of the uh, facet uh, joints uh, and uh, basically, basically they are oriented uh, obliquely in all three uh, uh, planes. Now we will uh, discuss the anatomy of the facet. Basically, uh, the anatomy of the facet joint. The, the facet joints and the thoracic spine, they are uh, monotonous and shingle-like, uh, shingle-like arrangements. And this, they uh, are situated uh, in the cleft formed by the, lemin, the, the lamina and the, um, the transverse uh, process. While in the number region, as we can see, and the number region, they are totally above the lamina and the transverse processing. The transverse process uh, in the thoracic region and thoracic region are different as compared to the lumbar um, and cervical uh, region. The transverse process, they are directed uh, dorsally and laterally and well off of the uh, facet uh, joint as compared to the uh, lumbar region. And the second difference uh, from the number uh, is uh, that uh, each of the um, transverse process have a facet joint for the articulation with the 
likely numbered array. Now, the ribs uh, are triplets uh, with the likely and numbered uh, vertebra at the superior articular uh, uh, facet uh, and uh, the one level below at the um, inferior articular facet, except the uh, T, uh, the first rib and the uh, tenth rib and the uh, 11th and 12th rib that have only one articulation with the uh, vertebral bodies because these are atypical vertebrae and they have no uh, have single demi for articulation with the likely numbered uh, vertebrae. Now we'll uh, discuss the lamina and spans process. The lamina are in Dr. Roman, can you make it uh, within time? Because it's already 25 minutes now. Uh, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Yeah, please. Huh? So, uh, the lamina arrangement is a single like uh, structure. The lam lamina of the above overlaps with the lamina of the uh, level below. So, mostly it covers the interlamina space in between the two. So. So I'm skipping uh, these, uh, so I would uh, uh, discuss the uh, ligaments. Um, now we uh, will discuss the different ligaments uh, of the thoracic um, uh, spine region. Uh, the anterior flexion ligament is the strongest uh, broad ligament spanning the ventral surface of all vertebral bodies. The width increases uh, from uh, rostral to caudal, from the cervical down to the lumbar region. At the lumbar region, it almost covers half of the vertebral uh, bodies. And it is made of multiple layers, and the inner in, innermost layer uh, covers the single uh, spinal level. The middle layer bridges up to two to three levels, and the outer layer covers up to the uh, five levels. It basically uh, uh, provides stability to the spine uh, and resist uh, uh, hyperextension and translation. Now the posterior uh, longitudinal ligament. The posterior longitudinal ligament is uh, uh, present behind the vertebral bodies uh, at the same vertebral body. It is uh, thinner as compared to the uh, disc uh, at the level of the disc. It is broad. And, and literally, it blends with the intervertebral, uh, the annulus fibrosis, and the dura mater. Now, uh, the ligamentum flavum, uh, the yellow uh, ligament presents from. Dr. Raman, can, yes. you, can you please uh, get to conclude? Because the uh, other speakers otherwise won't get time. Can I request you to please move on to your conclusion? I Just uh, see one or two slides I left. Yeah. This is my um, the last or the other slide Thanks. in my life. Thank you. Thick yellow ligament. Uh, so uh, it is a, um, originates from the superior surface of the lamina below, inserts on the anterior surface of lamina above, and it's uh, uh, absent on the superior part of the anterior surface of lamina. The um, two layer creates a gliding motion. The outer gear discontinues in the midline and it provides a cleavage for the uh, surgeon to avoid any dural violation. Now uh, we will discuss the interspinous and supraspinous ligament. In the um, supraspinous uh, ligament is situated above the uh, at the tip of the uh, spinous process made of two gears while the in, uh, in the interspinous ligament is uh, uh, situated between the spinous process. It arises from the, border, the upper superior border of the spinous process below and inserts at the uh, lower border of the spinous process above. Both of these ligaments help uh, to uh, um, resist the hyperflexion uh, of the uh, spine and provide stability to the spine. So thank you. This is my last slide. And thank you all. Of 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aman, for a very, very comprehensive coverage of uh, anatomy of the thoracic spine. Uh, we'll now move Thank on you. to our next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Zia Gokuslan, who is a uh, is a professor, Julius, Dr. Julius Stoll, professor and head of unit at the Warren Alpert Medical School at Brown University, where he is also the director of the Complex Spine Fellowship Program. He's a well-recognized expert in the field of spine surgery uh, with a subspeciality interest in um, spinal oncology on which he's published quite widely. It is hence my uh, privilege and honor to invite him to give his talk on uh, posterior approaches to the thoracic spine. Dr. Zia, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for including me in the program this morning. And um, uh, and then Dr. Kakar gave a very nice uh, talk to set the stage here um, to uh, uh, to talk about some of the posterior applications. I know Dr. Asakar is going to talk about uh, uh, the um, anterior approaches to the uh, thoracic spine. Uh, I, pr I hope you're able to see my screen here. Uh, is that correct? It's all good. All right, thanks. Um, and so um, um, I was hoping to follow Dr. Asakar's um, uh, presentation earlier. And so with that in mind, I just wanted to put uh, the slide up uh, to uh, set the stage here. Uh, so uh, there are pathologies where there, uh, it may be primarily uh, they may be primarily anteriorly situated uh, and in order to get to them you may want to think about some anterior approaches um, and then eventually in this particular case we ended up approaching this from posteriorly but if you if you thought that you could get to this tumor from anteriorly you really need to sort of look at what is in the way to uh, get the exposure you can see the sternum is coming all the way up here and this is a lesion at the t34 level this is a patient with colon cancer uh, involving two vertebral bodies. And you can see the aortic arch up here. Uh, both of those structures are going to be in the way to get the adequate exposure to be able to do this operation um, uh, from anteriorly uh, through a midline approach. So it's it's a good idea, good habit to look at these uh, mid sagittal images on the MRI scan or the CAT scan to see how these critical structures relate to these uh, uh, pathologies that may be anteriorly situated. In the thoracic spine, we have the luxury of um, being able to cut essentially all the thoracic nerve roots to gain access to the ventral compartment from the posterior approach. And hence, uh, we have a great deal of flexibility. Uh, that is not true at the T1 level. Uh, we don't like to sacrifice the T1 nerve root. You end up with a significant uh, loss of function in the hand as well as um, uh, Horner syndrome. But the, for all other levels, you can do that. In the lower thoracic spine, T10, 11, 12, when you cut the nerve root, you do get significant uh, abdominal asymmetry as a result of that. Uh, but this gives us a great deal of flexibility in approaching uh, the pathologies that may be primarily ventrally situated all through a dorsal approach. Here's a patient who has a lung cancer a metastasis to T3 vertebrae. You can see the collapsed vertebral body here. Again, this patient 76 years old has an inoperable lung cancer uh, and we don't want to subject this patient to this kind of comor uh, the morbidity of anterior approach. And so this can all be approached posteriorly. As a matter of fact, in this particular instance, we approached it using minimum invasive techniques uh, with bilateral Wilson approaches, uh, two tubular retractors. And, and you can see here, we can get a uh, uh, very nice circumferential look here. Um, even uh, with these minimally invasive approaches, we tied off the nerve roots, which allowed us to gain access to the ventral compartment. We completed the corpectomy here. We replaced it with a, a cage that's filled with bone. And you can see, uh, subsequently, we placed percutaneous screws here. Um, um, as Dr. Kakar very nicely uh, showed earlier, uh, uh, using fluoroscopy guidance in this instance, and you can see the cage uh, ventrally. Uh, this tends to be the workhorse for a lot of the thoracic spinal metastases uh, that we treat. This shows the patient's uh, um, uh, stab wounds, so to speak, on either side of the spine and uh, how the incision would have been like uh, if we were to do a, a more standard uh, open approach in this particular case. This patient was discharged home several days after presentation with complete resolution of the pain and recovery of the neurological dysfunction. Uh, posterior approaches also are commonly used for deformity operations. Now, we uh, have a series of surgical procedures that we do uh, to correct uh, uh, sagittal plane deformities in the thoracic spine. And these are progressively, um, you know, for set resections, um, submit Peterson or Ponte osteotomies, um, uh, pedicle subtraction osteotomy, uh, and then finally, uh, vertebral column resection. All of these techniques are highly effective 
in shortening the posterior column and um, uh, restoring the patient's uh, uh, sagittal balance. Um, uh, this schematically shows how um, uh, these procedures are performed and you typically start from the midline and you do get these uh, what we call chevron types of osteotomies uh, uh, where uh, the thecal sac is exposed in the middle and your um, the resection goes across the facet joint with complete removal of the facets. Uh, and you can see the exiting nerve root coming from above. And also you can see the traversing nerve root passing by. And you create this gap here, which then can be a close. In the setting of uh, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, this kind of strategy is used to uh, essentially break the disc anteriorly by closing the posterior gap. Uh, in the cases where the discs are relatively well preserved, the pontiosteotomies are used, like in Charmon's cases, uh, kyphoses, and so forth. Um, and you can achieve very nice restoration of the uh, posterior uh, 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 shortening of the posterior column and restoration of the sagittal balance. This shows how this progressively goes from midline laterally. You, you progressively keep removing, uh, and you go across the facet joints. Uh, and of course, the pedicle screws are again uh, placed. Uh, uh, as described earlier with using the anatomical landmark fluoroscopy imaging, uh, we, we most, like, uh, most recently I've been using image guided navigation. And then one can attach the, um, uh, the rods, as you can see here, and shorten the posterior column that really allows you to restore the uh, to the lordosis. And uh, this shows some of the uh, uh, compressive forces that you need to apply to shorten the posterior column. Uh, so the, the, the laminectomy doesn't really do anything to do uh, posterior column in terms of shortening, uh, you really have to remove at least the facet joints and then you do a chevron types of osteotomies uh, using uh, Smith Peterson technique in the setting of ankylosing spondylitis or ponties, or um, you have to really um, do more extensive resections such as particle subtraction osteotomies, the bone graft is born here. The, then this is the more extensile version of shortening of the posterior column, but in this instance, you also shorten the interior column a little bit here. Um, and this is a, a more aggressive removal. You can get up to 30 degrees of correction with these kind of resections. As you can see, uh, facet joints are removed above and below. Um, the pedicles is exposed, and then uh, uh, you do the cancellation here, and wedge of uh, vertebrae is removed. So this allows you to collapse the back of the vertebral body and then substantially shorten the uh, back of the uh, spinal column. Again, this is a very effective shortening procedure uh, that restores those absolute lordosis. And, um, for this, you can um, uh, you can really I, I think I think this operation doing like two chevron osteotomies, uh, one above, one below. This allows you to isolate the pedicle, as you can see, um, and then you go to cancellate the pedicles uh, as shown here, um, and then um, and then uh, when you uh, uh, resect the lateral wall of the vertebral bodies and then collapse the vertebra. Uh, you can shorten the posterior column substantially, but also there's some shortening of the anterior column happens here as well. And as a result of that, you can really restore the side to load us very effectively. Bone grafts can again be placed here. Uh, vertebral column resection is sort of the most extensile version of this. Uh, for that, you have to do um, a pretty extensile either costal transversectomy or lateral extracavitary approaches here. The difference between the two is that uh, costal transversectomy it uh, takes only a couple of centimeters of rib, whereas the lateral extracavitary approach takes up to seven centimeters of rib. You go all the way um, uh, to the, almost a rib angle, and that gives you a much more ventral look of the uh, spinal column. So for a, a very significant deformities, fixed deformities, this kind of approach can be very useful. And we also do spondylectomies using similar type of approach, and I'll show you some case examples of that. Here's a, a patient with a T12 L1 uh, prior discitis of semiolitis uh, who is uh, left with this fixed deformity at the toracolumbar junction. Um, and in this particular instance, we are going to use both uh, posterior um, approach and resect everything posteriorly, but also uh, resect the anterior column all through dorsal route and then uh, restore the patient's sagittal lordosis. For that, we typically use a distractible cage, which is really placed. Um, and then we attach the temporary rods, as you can see here. Um, and the, the, the nuts are loose here so that I can apply distractive force here in the front and uh, restore the uh, kyphosis and then go ahead and uh, replace the rods and put another one on the opposite side and replace the rod with more lordotic lard. Here is in the OR. Uh, you can see bilateral extensile in this instance would be lateral extracavitary approach that we removed 
everything all the way out to six, seven, eight centimeters of rib uh, above and below the vertebra of interest. Um, and then um, there's a cage placed anteriorly as you can see, we're applying distractive force to restore the anterior column. And then uh, we will shorten the posterior column with some compression. And you can achieve outstanding uh, reconstruct, I mean, restoration of uh, uh, sagittal balance here um, by both elongating the anterior column with distractive or cage, but also shortening the posterior column with, uh, with compression across the uh, dissociated segment. Um, here is a more extensile version of this. Uh, this is a patient who had a prior history of uh, you know, breast cancer. Um, and then you can see a previous operation up top here. But this patient developed multiple compression fractures in the mid thoracic spine, three collapsed vertebral bodies, and a fixed deformity as she was really looking at the floor. And so this to be then an extensile uh, operation where we did a three level uh, spondylectomy. As you can see, all three levels are uh, uh, removed. Now we completely dissociated the spine in the mid thoracic region, which allowed us really to place it anywhere we want. And you can see as a result of that, we again placed a distractible cage anteriorly. Um, and brought the patient's spine back. Um, and there's a large gap here. We typically use a fibular allograph struck uh, uh, spanning the gap here. And then uh, the sagittal plane, as you can see, uh, very, very nicely restored. Uh, these are po very powerful techniques. Um, when you resect the spinal column, you can really put it anywhere you like. Um, controlling the spine becomes a bit of an issue. Uh, we use temporary rods for that uh, to be able to um, do that. And typically it takes two surgeons, one deploy deploying the cage anteriorly, another one controlling the posterior elements uh, or the rods uh, posteriorly, loosening the nuts as the distractions applied, applied across. And I'll, I'll show this case as the um, sort of the video presentation index case uh, for a total spondylectomy, dissipation with a chordoma. Uh, this patient presented with uh, three uh, month history of uh, radicular pain and some uh, weakness in the lower extremities. Again, gait impairment, CT guided biopsy approved this to be a chordoma. And I'll I have a video here that's about I think, five minutes. I'll share that with you. Uh, but uh, before that, I just want to walk through this, this the, the steps of the procedure. And this shows you everything that you can really do from posteriorly. Uh, we're going to be doing laminectomies here above and below the area of interest. Uh, here's the, what's I highlighted as purple is the area of interest. And we will do a bilateral um, uh, uh, extensile, what I would say, costal transversectomies or lateral extracavitary resections where ribs are going to be resected almost five, six centimeters on either side, which would allow us to really gain access to the um, uh, ventral compartment. Now, you can see here uh, after the laminectomies are performed above and below, then we're going to go ahead and amputate the particles on both sides and take the posterior elements in one piece. And then here is in the OR, that's how it looks like. The patient's head is on the left top corner, the legs are on the right uh, bottom here. And here are the posterior elements, the particle screws are in place already uh, for uh, stabilization. And we are amputating the, uh, uh, transecting the particles on both sides using osteotomes here. And here are the posterior elements are removed. And then the next part of the operation is really uh, pretty standard for a lot of the uh, VCRs or vertebral column resections, and this is true for spondylectomy as well. And so we follow this uh, uh, segmental vessel. You can come, you can see these vessels are coming off the aorta, and they they turn into intercostal vessels. and And these are the various tethers from these vessels. There is a one nutrient branch that goes into the vertebral body that is a tether that you need to release when you come from posteriorly. Another one is a radicular branch that goes into the um, uh, nerve root and into the spinal canal through that, and that needs to be released. And then you stay in this uh, realer plane uh, from dorsally, and then you can develop this plane very nicely and stay dorsal to the great vessels that keeps you out of trouble, uh, so to speak. And I'll show you that in a video. This shows the, uh, the channel where we work through uh, between the vertebral body. The people think this is a subperiosteal sub plane. It is not. There, you cannot really elevate the periosteum here. You have to stay outside the periosteum um, you know, medial to the uh, intercostal uh, uh, vessels, um, and then uh, stay in this areal or plane to be able to develop this. This keeps you posterior to the esoph esophagus in the upper thoracic spine, and keeps, keeps you posterior to the great vessels um, uh, uh, all throughout. And uh, this is the plane that's where you need to be. Uh, and this then shows you uh, what one can achieve. Um, uh, we typically try to put something ventral to the spinal column here, 
Uh, you can use a malleability retractor that I use in one case. Uh, we can use a silastic sheet here to protect the structures interiorly. But again, these are the these are the intercostal vessels that serve as a highway for you to find this uh, plane. Here's in the OR, um, uh, this is the dorsal view. You can see we cut the nerve roots on both sides. Again, we can uh, really sacrifice them with impunity. Uh, the pedicle screws above and below. I do have a temporary rod on one side and you can see the malleable retractor that is situated ventrally. Uh, we do have this pu pulley system we uh, typically use, but you can do that without that as well. This pulley allows you to pass a uh, Thomida, a thread, a thread wire saw around the spinal column underneath the tickle sac. And then there are two wheels here, uh, one for uh, dorsally situated wire and one for ventrally situated wire. And then, and then you can really cut the spinal column away from the spinal cord. This is a relatively safe way of doing it. This pulley is attached to the rods posteriorly, as you can see here, and it doesn't move. So it's, it's a nice way of cutting it. And it shows you in the operating room how this looks like. Here are the pedicle screws above and below. Uh, our, uh, our pulleys has already been positioned here. And you can see the wires that have been passed, uh, one ventral to the thickle sac around the spinal column. You can see this elastic sheet uh, protecting the ventral structures. And these uh, wires then are passed through this pulley, one above, one below. Uh, there are two wheels here. Um, and then you can cut the spinal column away in this direction. And this allows you, you can see, um, you're cutting it now. Uh, and this allows you to make very precise cuts. You can cut through the bone, you can cut through the disc space, and that allows you to resect it. Um, and then after, in this particular case, we cut the disc above and below, and then, and then we got to be able to extract that vertebra, and that you can see it's coming out. And then when you put this vertebra with the posterior uh, elements together, you can get the circumferential uh, uh, segment uh, of the vertebra and the space where the spinal cord used to be. Of course, that leaves a large defect that needs to be filled in, uh, with a, a uh, with something, and we typically use a distractible cage. The silastic sheet is now pushed all the way down, uh, protecting the parietal pleura, and ventral structures, the great vessels, and then the plate, uh, the cage is uh, deployed, and the instrumentation is finalized here. And this is how it looks like. And the end, at the end, you can see the cage anteriorly, and then you can also see the uh, X-ray on the right side, uh, showing two levels of fixation above and below, and the cage in place. Now let me go to the case and show you. This is uh, this is meant to be with uh, we would be by uh, um, uh, uh, with special glasses uh, to get uh, 3D uh, uh, appreciation, but um, uh, you can still appreciate uh, uh, probably see the details of the surgical procedure. First part is really to expose the uh, posterior thoracic spine and the uh, dorsal musculature. Uh, we try to keep the fascia intact here. Um, uh, so that uh, we can use that for uh, traction. We're going to separate the paraspinal uh, musculature uh, um, uh, and uh, we will preserve it. And then we will place a, uh, we will place a Penrose drain around it to be able to move it laterally or medially, depending upon if we are working in the midline or we are working along the uh, rib spaces. Uh, you can see we are placing a, a suture on the fascia here, which will be tied and uh, we will use a a uh, yellow fish hook uh, in order to um, uh, retract this away uh, uh, from out of way. Um, in this uh, uh, video, you are seeing a dissection of the ribs laterally. Uh, you can see the Penrose drain, how the Penrose drain is retracting the uh, um, uh, paraspinal musculature. I think this is on the uh, left side of the patient. So the midline is uh, toward the muscle there and the musculature is completely pulled out of the way. And we are cutting the rib, um, uh, a couple of centimeters of rib has been cut here. This allows you to get into that uh, 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 retropleural plane and we'll do the same. And so you have to cut two ribs, obviously, uh, the one uh, that is articulating uh, with the vertebra above, uh, another one um, right below that. Um, and then we, uh, you can cut the transverse processes here at the same time if they are not involved with the pathology or in the form of the case, no issue. Um, and then you get into that plane and we find the intercostal vessel and site, say dorsal to it, um, and typically use blunt dissection for that. A uh, couple of tethers you need to release. Um, we typically do that on the direct vision using bipolar cautery, one that goes into the foramen um, uh, across the nerve root, but the nerve root can also be cut uh, from outside and then separately you can cut it from inside and then get into that plane and, and uh, gradually develop that plane under direct vision. 
Um, uh, and it is it is a nice, uh, uh, smooth plane where if you get into it, uh, it will separate uh, uh, nicely. Um, and if you release the tethers, then you can uh, place something around it. And then finally, uh, we are making the holes for the placement of the uh, pedicle screws, cannulating them. Um, and then subsequently, uh, we will place the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, markers for that. Uh, typically use an x-ray to verify the trajectories and then uh, subsequently the screws are uh, implanted um, and then uh, at this you know this operation was done a little bit differently in this in the sense that we didn't do the laminectomy first but then the laminectomies are completed uh, now the ventral uh, structures are dissected away you can see the elastic sheet protecting them uh, we use the tomato thread wire saws these are the special passers that allow you to pass the wire underneath the tickle sac uh, using this uh, plastic tubular guide. Um, this then will be wrapped around the spinal column and will be pulled from the other side. Um, and so that um, yeah, you, can, um, uh, you can encircle the spine, so to speak. And then we will use that, that special pulley system as I've shown earlier uh, to be able to cut the uh, spine. And so after this is done, we typically put uh, uh, at least one of the rods in place uh, temporarily to stabilize the spine. Um, and then rod will be used in order to um, attach the uh, uh, attach the pulley. Um, uh, and these wires are going to be pulled through the pulley. Uh, you can see the part of, part of spinal vasculature musculature is on the, in the Penrose drain, and it can be manipulated uh, medial or laterally um, uh, when you're passing the uh, wire, as well as uh, you're putting it through the uh, toward the pulley. And the, in just a moment, you'll see the final uh, sort of the UB two rods uh, not completely placed. And uh, we have the uh, wire used. The wire is used to cut the spine. Um, and then when you do that, the vertebra becomes very completely free. And then you can pick it up and um, uh, deliver it away from the uh, tickle sack and uh, uh, take it out of the whole so Subsequently, this is reconstructed that I've shown earlier. Uh, with the uh, distractible cage um, uh, um, and, um, and then the patient's closed. So uh, I'll stop there and, and see if there are any uh, questions uh, from the audience. Um, I know we're running a little late already. So, um, fantastic talk. Uh, uh, many of you made it look really easy and you spoke about it quite easy, but uh, for most of us who probably even tried to do this or done a few of these, these are very challenging operations requiring a lot of skill and uh, planning. There are um, a few questions that have come up, um, starting from uh, Dr. Parik, who has a question about anterior approach. I know your talk is on a posterior approach, but um, uh, you did mention about the anterior approach. So there's a question about uh, T12 L1 lesions as to a preference of anterior versus posterior approach and how you make that decision. Uh, well, I think that any anytime we decide between anterior and posterior approach, uh, we do uh, uh, take into consideration a variety of factors. Uh, one is so it depends on what we are dealing with. Is it a deformity case or is it a tumor case? If it's a tumor case, a metastatic tumor or a primary tumor. In deformity cases, we virtually uh, approach all of them from posteriorly. Uh, in tumor cases, metastatic tumors, we approach them almost always posteriorly, um, uh, unless the, the patient is young and is able to tolerate the anterior approach relatively easily. In the case of primary tumors, we typically approach them uh, in two stages. Either uh, we start from the from the from the back, mobilize everything, and then go to the front and extract the tumor, and then uh, reconstruct the spine if needed. If we can go back to the back again to finalize the uh, reconstruction, so it really depends on what kind of pathology we are dealing with, and then we make the choice accordingly. Uh, certain parts of the spine is very difficult to get to through anterior approach. Uh, T3, T4 is, uh, is a very difficult area with a straight anterior approach. If you are going to uh, need to have that sort of exposure, we typically use what we call a trap, a trap door exposure, where you have a, a neck dissection coupled with mid midline sternotomy, and then we make an incision uh, between the, uh, the, the fourth and the fifth rib below the uh, nipple, 
and then open up that uh, corridor to be able to gain direct anterior access to T3-4. Uh, and the, the limiting factor here is the aortic arch uh, and then the two carotid vessels that are suspending it. And you cannot really uh, stretch that area very much. But the trapdoor exposure allows you to go around it from this, you know, a little bit away off midline view um, and uh, you know uh, push the esophagus and the vessels away and then uh, get a midline. I have. Uh, uh, pictures of that in a case examples, if you like, I'll be glad to share those. Uh, but certain parts of the thoracic spine is very difficult to get to anteriorly and requires fairly extensile and a highly morbid approach. And we don't use typically those approaches in metastatic tumors in deformity cases. We only use them in primary tumor cases. And then those tend to be most of the time staged, starting from back and then going to the front as a second stage of the procedure. Okay. There's um, another question that's come through about the name of the procedure, whether you call it a costal transversectomy or a posterior spondylectomy. Yeah, so um, uh, I would say that if you start from the midline, and maybe uh, Dr. Vasakar is going to cover this when he's talking about the thoracic disc herniation. So the, 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 the simplest approach we do, the midline approach, like the laminectomy procedure. If you go a little bit, if you want to shorten the posterior column, laminectomy doesn't do anything to the posterior column, it exposes the spine. It's a great approach for a spinal cord. It's a great approach for a lot of the intradural tumors and uh, intramedullary tumors, uh, but it doesn't really do anything from a deformity perspective. If, uh, if you're going to try to correct the sagittal balance, you start to take out the joints. So the first step would be the resection of the facet joints. That will allow you to shorten the spine a little bit. And then you have to do um, uh, Chevron osteotomies, which include both the Smith-Peterson osteotomy as well as the Ponte osteotomy that allows you to shorten the posterior column a little further. And then, and then the next step would be um, a uh, two costal transversectomy approach. Uh, or let me take it. The, the next step would be if you, from an exposure perspective, like a transpedicular approach. Transpedicular approach we commonly use in paracentral thoracic disc herniations. Uh, um, and the, that serves us quite well. Uh, and if you need more ventral exposure, then you have to go a little more lateral. And so the next step would be costal transversectomy approach. You take the transverse process, you take the pedicle, and typically three or four centimeters of the rib that allows you more of a uh, oblique ventral view of the cord. And if you do that from both sides, uh, you can see nicely, except for the very central portion of the spinal cord where it will be tucked in and will be away from your view. In order to see that, you have to really do what we call a lateral extracavitary approach. And for that, you have to resect the rib all the way out to the rib angle. You know, posterior, the ribs comes in and then angles forward. You have to go all the way posterior rib angle. And then, and then you can have a direct, direct ventral view of the spinal cord. Um, and this is particularly uh, beautiful in the mid-thoracic region where the curved spinal cord is, uh, is in a kyphotic position. And if you take the ribs out on both sides, you can have a direct ventral view of the spinal cord. And, and so this is from the midline going all the way out. Laminectomy, transpedicular approach, costal transrotectomy, lateral extracavitary approach. And then the next step, then you have to turn the corner. There will be a tor lateral torcotomy approach. And then if you really need a perfect midline view, you have to come all the way to the front, which would be like a, a median stenotomy or a a trap tour type of exposure, which is commonly used for the upper uh, thoracic spine. But those are the sort of the circumferentially approaches that are available to us, depending upon the extent of the pathology. A lot of the centrally situated calcified thoracic discs, for example, we almost always approach them from, uh, from a lateral thoracotomy or a, a direct anterior approach in the upper thoracic spine. If it is a soft disc herniation, and if the dura is not really involved, in many of those cases, we can use lateral extracavitary approach, costal transectomy approach, and get the disc away from the tachyl sac. In some cases, the disc can be penetrated, the, have, may have penetrated the dura, can be stuck to the spinal cord. In those cases, I want to see the spinal cord. And so I need to have a direct view of the spinal cord above and below so we can microscopically dissect it away from it. I had a question for you, which is about what bone graft material you would prefer to use when reconstructing. But in the interest of time, maybe you want to answer it at the end, and uh, if that's okay with you, it'll take two seconds. Uh, okay. Yeah. Each end cases we use autologous bone that we harvested during the laminectomy. 
or a costal transectomy and you use mashed up bone and use with demolized bone matrix. In all tumor cases, I use DBX uh, anteriorly cadaveric bone graft and the posterior lung defects, we close them with uh, fibular allograft. In rare cases, we would use vascularized grafts uh, with uh, vascular particle, either cost rib graft or uh, free fibula uh, that is vascularized. Thank you very much. So, Fantastic yeah. talk. Let Thanks for your time. I'll now yeah. get you on to speak to Jati. I, I like to say one beautiful, beautiful surgical technique which uh, Dr. Zia has shown. Uh, one, uh, one nice point because I've seen Professor Tomito presenting this for 30 years ago. Uh, but then the, the, the approach of the, the wire they send it from uh, is more ventral to dorsal. I like this one, the, the one which you are putting around the vertebral body and bringing it, hook it to a, a holder on one side and pulley. And, and you know that that absolutely you know protects the spinal cord. Uh, this is a very huge uh, technical difference. Uh, what I saw earlier, and Professor Tomato was explaining to us long years ago, because yeah. you know, uh, you I hope you remember that this technique. You uh, know, I, I, know, I, I, I I do remember that as much. My Italian colleagues use that as well. They put a metal retract the ventral to the cord and use the holes to be able to, and then the wire always comes to the spinal cord. Yeah which yes, makes, me, yes. uh, makes me very uncomfortable. But this, my did credit for this pulley goes to my colleague, who's one of my fellows, uh, Dr. Jean-Paul Volinsky, who is at Northwestern now. Uh, he is the one really who uh, is the brainchild behind this, who put it together. Um, and uh, so and, and we have been using it uh, uh, since then. It, it, is a, it is an ingenious way of protecting the spinal cord. Yeah, this is extremely good because uh, personally, I have listened to Professor Tomito's uh, lectures. And, uh, you know, he used to say that, you know, how they designed this, uh, this wire. This terminal wire is so thin, light, and, you know, uh, it, it's so thin. Uh, it, it can be used so lightly. And it is very easy to, uh, to negotiate through. As I, I can able to see the way you negotiated both ventral and dorsal to the vertebral body. And it is very nice. And the pulley, that, that's very amazing because I think that this is one technique which is going to completely transform this approach. Well, well, thank and, you so and much. And the resources. A very, very kind of you uh, to note that. Thank you. Thank you. Girish. Excellent talk, Zia. Hello from man. <laughs> Impressive. Wow. Thank you, Richard. Well, so you. we can see you soon. We can go uh, to Richard, no? Can I share my screen? I think this is. Yeah, uh, before, before that, you know, before that, I like to. Say something about Richard's, uh, you know, design is very high from Apofix, you know, Centaur and Zephyr uh, instrumentations. It's one of the top top uh, class instruments which we all of us uh, have used over a period of time. I'm really happy to have Professor Richard here now from France. Professor Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Jyoti. Do you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh... Zia, he, he uh, conclude uh, at the end and uh, get a good, uh, a good panorama of, uh, of the accesses to the thoracic disc herniation. And I share 100% his, uh, his philosophy and I'll show you this through my, my lecture. So uh, thoracic disc herniation, uh, the question that we raise usually is what would be the best access and what would be the technology to get this safer uh, in a safe way. So I will go through indication, anterior versus posterior access, which what, what, what are the best indication for each access. Then I will uh, show you my background of endoscopic to thoracic surgery versus micro. And uh, finally, uh, we will go through uh, some uh, case-based presentation. So thoracic disc herniation, as you know, is rare, is difficult case, is uh, uh, a bit uh, risky uh, because of the myelopathy, because the dorsal cord is uh, so poor in terms of, uh, of vasculature, and it's a narrow canal, canal by definition. So working in, uh, in, in uh, the thoracic canal with a huge and calcified disc, uh, uh, as, you, as you know, is very... Uh, very risky. So uh, the clinical aspects, I do always operate on those patients with myelopathy. I will not consider surgery for axial pain. Let's make 
uh, this uh, definitely uh, clear, no, no back pain, axial dorsal pain was even huge thoracic disc. I would not consider surgery unless uh, the SEP and MEP are, uh, are uh, um, logic. Preoperatively, I will do all what's needed to have a clear view of the 3D anatomy of my herniation. You can see the MRI here always uh, uh, associate this to uh, a CT scan and you can see the degree of uh, uh, calcification of these lesions. It's a huge mass, uh, median and uh, uh, with the high uh, anatomical conflict with the cord. So, Make sure that all your images are well seen. This is another uh, MRI also. So I will, uh, uh, this patient had, uh, was referred to us after a posterior laminectomy and posterior bilateral pediculectomy. Also uh, get uh, a view on, uh, on all the regional anatomy like here. So you can even uh, memorize the, the shape of the osteophytes in order to locate your anatomy if you are going through a very uh, a keyhole surgery, for example. So everything is important to uh, make sure that you are on the right spot. I also um, uh, consider the length of my decompression from cranial, cranial to caudal uh, aspect. You can see here, and uh, uh, sometimes I'm I'm not doing this anymore, but uh, if uh, if the terminal uh, uh, aspect is uh, a, a concern, I will uh, perform my uh, uh, um, angiogram to see where is the uh, Adam Kievich artery, the great uh, cord artery. So make sure that your pre-op evaluation is complete, uh, com associating MRI, but not only MRI, but also CT scan. And the level, uh, identification of the level is important. So you have to see your MRI from the uh, uh, sacrum till the site, till the index level. Make sure that you can uh, count your vertebra during surgery if you're not using navigation. So now what about the access? Look at those two uh, herniation, both are symptomatic, both are uh, uh, a candidate for surgery. The one on the left had a median and calcified disc, the one on the right had a posterolateral uh, uh, compression. And as uh, Professor, as Zia says earlier, uh, the one on the right could be approached posteriorly, especially if it's a soft disc, the one on the left, it's very risky and dangerous, and it, we should avoid the posterior access unless you are a master of extra cavitary access and you can go uh, far lateral to get to the anterior aspect of the cord. In my hand, uh, the one on, on the left is a good candidate for anterior surgery, even uh, direct access. So let's uh, start with the posterior access and show you my last uh, technology to get out uh, with those so soft uh, disc posterolaterally uh, uh, position, uh, uh, located. The posterior access, as, as it has been said already, uh, uh, is, uh, is from mid uh, and laminectomy. This is not uh, the optimal access because we know that uh, manipulating the cord is dangerous. So I will go till uh, uh, cutting the transverse process, the pedicle, a part of the body vertebra and, and coming extra cavitary to, uh, uh, to the cord and taking out the herniation. Uh, what I create actually is a, a, a channel, a funnel through the pedicle and, and through uh, the transverse process and and the uh, and the rib in order to get uh, to contour the cord and get around it. So let me show you uh, a case, uh, a clinical case here. I uh, I go tubular access, three D navigated, and this is for me today the safer way to uh, approach it and the minimal invasive way to get out. With the herniation. This is my uh, the patient who had uh, I think T8, T9 uh, posterolateral soft disc. Uh, you can see the CT scan here. 
Uh, this is our platform. It's a 3D uh, fluoroscope combined to navigation. And this is typically what I do. I start uh, placing my reference frame upper to my uh, site. And then before getting my skin incision, I locate the, the uh, compression side here. And you can see on, uh, uh, on, uh, on the uh, bottom or, and the bottom and, and left side, my tubes placed sequentially under navigation. So my tube, my corridor of access is placed under navigation and optimally uh, placed uh, on the site of my uh, on my target. So you can see here, my pointer inside the tube is at the transverse, is at the transverse uh, uh, at the junction between the transverse process, the rib, uh, and down to the pedicle. So you can see on my navigation screen where I am, and this is typically I go always, of course on the caudal pedicle to the herniation, to the, to the disc that the index level. Here is uh, the, the next step. I use my uh, uh, guided uh, uh, drill here. You can see the reference on the, uh, on the drill and you can see, sorry, and you can see my uh, uh, drilling is guided through 3D uh, anatomy. Then uh, once I took uh, out the pedicle, uh, I'm again, all to the nation, uh, take out the transverse process. I can open the canal. My pointer here already is inside the canal. I did not, I do not need to touch the cord or the, uh, or, or the dura. I'm just surrounding coming laterally. And this is here. If you, I will show you the, the, you can see the pedicle drilled here, the inner, inner cortex of the pedicle yes. still there. And you can see here my herniation uh, taken out with a hook uh, uh, surrounding surrounding the, uh, the, the cord. No need to put any retractor on the cord. So coming, creating a corridor uh, lateral to the, uh, to the site of, uh, of the compression. So for me today, this is my way of uh, uh, taking out herniation soft posterior lateral. And this is uh, uh, um, um, a few months after, this is the incision for the reference frame. And here is the uh, access to the tube. So this is typically, and by definition, what I call minimal invasive, no tendon disruption, and uh, uh, all the muscle is preserved. And the patient had a very uh, uh, smooth and uh, and comfortable post-operative uh, uh, results. Now, what about the anterior axis? Anterior axis is uh, is for such a uh, for such a herniation, and and especially those herniation are are in eighty percent calcified, like uh, like here, and you can see how uh, big it could be uh, before surgery. So. Uh, uh, it's, I, I always perform this under double lumen tracheal tube, uh, double lumen tracheal tube, because I tried the extra pleural axis. I don't have the obliquity uh, to be safely uh, facing my herniation. So I, I till now I go transpleural uh, and I'll show you uh, quickly the thoracoscopic axis and how did I switch to microscope uh, axis. So this is my, Typical, this has been operated in uh, uh, late 90s. So I start my, my thoracoscopic axis in 96. And this is, uh, I would say, probably uh, in, in 2000. I would not focus on, on the anatomy because it has been already uh, shown. But my uh, uh, strategy is to go lateral to uh, the uh, spine get out the uh, head of the rib, part of the pedicle and part of the body to create uh, 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 an access to the canal safely from uh, anterolateral aspect. So typically what, you, what I do is go first to the lateral uh, part of the body, uh, drill the head of the rib, drill a part of the pedicle, drill the body, and then I will uh, penetrate in the canal and dissect the herniation. And you'll see this in, in, under the microscope and, and the scope. 
So from uh, from the anatomical uh, views, this is what we 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 get here. Locate your your disc, then uh, make sure that you are on the right. If you're not using navigation, if you if we're using navigation, we don't need to do any X-rays because virtually we can we can uh, make sure that we are on the on the index level. Uh, open the pleura, take out the head of the rib. Uh, create um, uh, a partial corpectomy at the posterior uh, part of the body of the vertebra, expose the dura and decompress uh, the, uh, the cord. So uh, uh, let me uh, show you, this is typically uh, my uh, uh, setup for thoracoscopic access. Uh, here, here we are. Uh, at the beginning, I used. Uh, I, I, I've been doing this with uh, a colleague who is a thoracoscopic surgeon. And then, uh, uh, once I get my learning curve again, this is early 2000. Uh, I, I, I can do this by myself. Uh, the quest, the, the problem with thoracoscopic access. This is a four trocar that we use for surgery. The problem with thoracoscopic is that it's very difficult to teach. Uh, because it's uh, technically demanding. And this is also uh, why I switched to microscope. Uh, and uh, I, I will show you also the advantage of the microscope. So first trocar, second, third, and fourth. And then you can get uh, your triangulation around the, around the, the index level. Uh, this is typically the views that you get from, uh, uh, from there. And the end of the story is uh, having uh, uh, four scars uh, and one of the scar is used to uh, get your chest tube. Uh, I'll show you some examples here. This is, uh, so this is before, uh, and this is after you can see the corpectomy. And typically what I showed you, the, uh, the drilling bone, how, uh, how it's gone and, and get you access to the cord. You can see the, the, the scars of the patient. Uh, and actually what, uh, what you're doing is creating this uh, windows through the bone. It's I never uh, uh, add any stabilization uh, uh, on uh, on such a surgery. Another example: 56 years old. She's a nurse. Uh, this is a, a big calcified disc. Uh, this is a post-op at five days post-op. You can see my corpectomy posteriorly done through. Um, an endoscopic access, and this is the uh, post-op CT scan, the scars of the patient here uh, a few days after. Another example again here, uh, another uh, same, you can see the post-op scars here and the post-op CT scan. This is a very interesting case here with the patient who was referred to us after posterior, you can see the posterior pedicolectomy here and the pedicle is out. And then uh, we had to, uh, and patient get deteriorated. So uh, uh, we uh, went anteriorly and we took the, the calcified disc from anterior axis also through, uh, through endoscopy. You can see here the herniation, uh, calcified herniation out and you, uh, we can see the dura exposed. And this is the post-op here. Even in, in, in this case with posterior axis and anterior corpectomy, I did not stabilize this patient uh, uh, because he had a minimal uh, axial pain. Um, another case, this was stabilized because she has an extensive posterior axis before, was, before she was referred to us. And you can see the herniation here. And this is a post-op uh, 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 resection. What you're seeing here uh, on the T1 uh, post-op uh, uh, MRI is a uh, uh, a collagen a sponge that looks uh, hyper intense here. Now let's uh, uh, switch to the microscope axis. Uh, since the, the focal distance of the microscope is uh, comfortable today, uh, I'm, uh, I'm getting uh, my thoracic discs anteriorly with the microscope with one, a single incision, uh, not anymore uh, for uh, scars. So I locate uh, my the rib that I have to operate on. And you can see here, uh, my rib is resected using this piezoelectric scalpel bone, uh, bone scalpel here. And you can, uh, here we are, the, the, rub, uh, the rib is taken out uh, and you can see the exposure of, of, the pleura, of the pleura here. 
uh, uh, through five to, to eight centimeter single incision. So then uh, uh, we switched to microscope and we designed this uh, at, at that time uh, for this access. Today, we have many retractors that are uh, suitable for such a surgery. You can see here my uh, mini toracotomy uh, and the pleura uh, resection, we are on, uh, on the right side. Uh, I'm ventral to the patient, and you can see the exposure of, uh, of the rib, the head of the rib here. So posterior is up, uh, anterior is down, the legs are on the right side and the head on the left side. So uh, I expose the, the head of the rib. You can see the head of the rib here. You can see uh, the disc space, the index level with the posterior uh, part of the vertebra below uh, and uh, above. So my, uh, the head is cut using a, a azer drill, or if you wanna save the bone, you can use a, a, a chisel. Then uh, I start with this uh, 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 to, uh, thoracic uh, uh, hand piece uh, for the drill and uh, cut uh, the posterior drill, the posterior wall, uh, the, the posterior aspect of both vertebral uh, bodies. And then gradually using another drill, it's a diamond, uh, diamond uh, uh, drill to open the canal uh, and here. Then we we reach the posterior wall, you can see here uh, the dissection uh, of, uh, of the herniated disc. The, you, you will never know what kind of consistency you, you might uh, encounter du during this surgery. So this is, a, I'll show you a few examples. This is one of the herniation. This is a, a, another one more uh, calcified. You'll see that, uh, uh, it's almost a bone, here we are. You can see the calcified discs, the dura exposed. Let me show you, and this is cut with scissors to, uh, to release it. Uh, this is another uh, herniation, and you, can see, you will see it's almost a creamy uh, uh, type uh, of herniation. Uh, it's always very, uh, you know, uh, uh, stressful uh, situation when you penetrate in the canal and you don't know what kind of herniation uh, you will uh, uh, get. Uh, another one, you can see that it could be like Zia says, it could be transdural here. So taking out the herniation is a huge uh, defect in the dura and the arachnoid. Uh, and sometimes if the arachnoid is, uh, is still intact here, I do my uh, 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 dural repair using uh, uh, this kind of uh, sponge. This is, uh, uh, you know, a taco seal. Uh, and then I'll add to the taco seal uh, 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 collagen sponge. And this is the taco seal that covers the pleura at the end. And uh, you can see this is the final uh, aspect uh, with uh, reconstructing the pleura uh, and, uh, and uh, filling the defect. And then at the end, I will uh, reconstruct the rib uh, with a chest tube, of course. This is the rib and you can see the intercostal nerve here is preserved. Uh, and this is a rib placed uh, in place. Uh, I want to also uh, show you a, a variant of this. In, uh, in some situation, uh, the dissection might be very risky. And uh, if you feel like the herniation is stuck and uh, there is lots of adhesion to the dura, what I've done here is I've done what, I, what we call a, a floating technique. So I drill the part of the herniation and I... Um, uh, create a cavity below it. So you can see here, this is a pre-op. Uh, this is a immediate post-op and you can see my uh, uh, bone resection, even inside the dura, it has been uh, drilled. And this is um, at seven months, you can see the dura is getting to the cavity and this is at 10 months. 
and the cord is completely uh, uh, freed here. You can see the myelopathy patients get better. So I have a few cases where I uh, adopt this kind of technique because it was too risky. Be careful about this uh, scenario. Uh, this is a cord herniation and it might be uh, confused with a, a, a disc herniation. This is, so make sure that this is typically uh, the cord herniation. In my series, I've done 140 thoracic disc anteriorly from 96 to 2013, all were grade three, none was a, a non -myeloma, no myelopathy. Everybody's uh, had his myelopathy. I get five complications. Uh, one uh, was a CSF fistula, one get uh, deteriorated neurologically, and three kept intercostal neuralgia. 45% um, had uh, a clinical improvement of those patients. I evolve also through my uh, post-op uh, management. You can see at the beginning, uh, patients were staying three days at ICU, and now they are saying only one day. The hot hospital stay shrinks from 15 days at the beginning of my experience to six days, and the post-op analgesia is getting much better now. So as to conclude, this is a complex uh, pathology. We should not uh, ignore that. Technically highly demanding and uh, getting, uh, make sure that uh, you are able to, to be uh, uh, a 360 degree surgeon. So going posterior when it's appropriate, but going anterior also when it's a, a, a median and calcified disc. You, uh, I, I, I spend lots of time talking to my patients about, uh, about this pathology because you, he might be deteriorated uh, uh, temporarily. So I uh, will never neglect this aspect because this is a, a risky surgery. And, and, and managing complication with your uh, interventional radiologist, your anesthesiologist, et cetera, et cetera, is also a part of your... Uh, of your uh, experience. Thank you and uh, ready to answer your question if uh, any anybody has uh, questions. Uh, Richard, this is Ia here. Um, uh, a couple of comments and a question is that, uh, first of all, uh, it's a spectacular presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, and you have tremendous experience, I think more than anybody else in the world in doing these uh, cases. Um, a comment, number one, I think this is one of the most underappreciated pathologies in uh, spinal surgery or neurosurgery. I do see every year a couple of patients at least who are rendered paraplegic as a result of inadequate exposure. A laminectomy is transpedicular exposure where uh, the surgeon was nowhere close to the disc herniation and the patient really woke up uh, not being able to move their leg. So um, let me that make that comment. And second, uh, we learned uh, uh, by uh, experience that localization is incredibly challenging. And so for that yes. reason, what we do in these cases now routinely in every case, uh, we get definitely in all of these patients, uh, a myelo CT, CT myelograms. And before the myelogram ordered, we also ask the, uh, um, the interventional radiologist to place the marker, radio opaque marker in the particle of the vertebra of interest. And so we use that marker in the OR to plan the incision. And we also use that marker to localize, particularly in anterior approaches to the appropriate thoracic level. So we don't count from the top, from the bottom. We do use image guided navigation in all of these cases now, which is quite helpful. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, in terms of localization, it makes the operation so much simpler and takes so much of the anxiety away. In the old days, we used to count from the top, from the bottom. I have several cases I can share with you where the count from the top doesn't uh, correspond to the count to, from the bottom. And if you're not counting the same way in the OR, you'll find yourself in the wrong, at the wrong level. Um, and then finally, uh, one thing that we do differently than you do is that I am much more uh, aggressive in taking more bone, more exposure, and then stabilization. My threshold is very, very low. So I do laminectomies if I'm doing a posterior approach in every case. I take the pedicle down, I take the rib out. Um, I'm going to put a couple of screws above and below, stabilize the patient. In my opinion, these are such high risk procedures that, you know, the, the fact that the patient wakes up from the operation uh, neurologically better and at the end they improve is so critical. Anterior approaches, again, um, I used to not stabilize these patients and I do take much more bone than you do. I do almost like a hemicorpectomy above, you know, most of the vertebrae, all the way close to the disc space below, 
I see the PLL above and below um, a normal PLL, not the disc. So that's where I find the door I find laterally and then go above and below, find the PLL and then peel the thing off and not at the disc level. I've seen many times the people drilling into the disc and next thing you find yourself in the spinal cord. And so <laughs> I, I think the, the, I treat these cases as if it's like a tumor. I'm above it, I'm below it, I'm lateral to it and then pull the whole thing away from the cord. And then a couple of cases I did find intradural disc herniations, um, not only the arachnoid, like you've described in two cases, uh, I found it to be stuck to the spinal cord. So, uh, and so we had to open the door intraoperatively from an anterior approach um, and dissect the disc uh, directly away from the spinal cord. Uh, extremely challenging. You have to deal with the CSF issues as you've described uh, at the end of the operation. But um, uh, my hat is off to you. These are extremely challenging cases. You made it look so easy. No, I, I, I yeah. agree hundred percent with you. I think the safe way would be to take more bone and get caudally and cranially to the site of compression. What I what I'm doing is, uh, if if you are uh, localized to the disc level, you get to the base of the herniation and you can palpate this. So you can, with your hook, you can feel like you are on 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 the base. And before that, on the CT, uh, you have either a continuity between the disc and the herniation or some, some fibrous tissue or, or the PLL in between the true herniation and your disc. So all this mentally is in my head. And I, I feel, if, if I don't feel comfortable, I extend my, my drilling up or down. But uh, uh, I, I agree with you. It's safer to uh, make sure that you locate your dura above and below. But uh, till now, I, uh, I'm lucky <laughs> not to have uh, any, uh, any issue with the cord. But again, this is what I, I, I told you, that once I start opening the dura, it's my, the most anxious time where, where you start putting your hook inside and taking out what's, what's inside the PLA. But... Uh, uh, Yes, I, I, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, 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 please. I, I mean, I think you're extremely skilled, and I think that the 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 uh, I I I would argue that the more exposure makes the operation safer for the less yes. experienced. I think you're extremely <laughs> experienced, and you can get away with. And that's the reason why I feel that when I'm teaching this to our fellows and residents, I said, you know, I don't want to see the disc. I want to see the door above. I want to see the door below. I want to do it all the way to the opposite side. Typically, the way I do this after I get the exposure uh, at the level of interest where the rib head is fully exposed, I go, go in front of the rib head and drill. I go above the rib. I go below the rib. I haven't looked at the disc yet. And then take the rib off. Um, and, then, and then drill the pedicle out in the con in ipsilateral pedicle. Then, and then way, drill it way back, all the way back to the, almost the base of the transfer process. And so that... I am way lateral and posterior to the disc herniation. I'm above it. I'm below it. I am all the way circumferentially on the other side of the quad. We have not yet touched the disc. And then I go above and below, find the uh, thecal sac, and then go behind the disc and find the thecal sac, and then pull the whole thing away from the uh, dura, and then cut the PLL longitudinally, I mean, circumferentially around it, so you can just peel it off like the, 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 the book of it you know, the cover of a book, you just pull this away from it. Only then I can see the interface and dissect it. And, and if it's stuck, and I can sometimes even see it through the dura, you can see the spinal, the dura is semi-transparent if you irrigate it, and you can see the spinal cord through it pulsating. And you can see if you, whether or not, when you tug on it, the spinal cord is coming with it. And that all determines sort of how we're going to go uh, afterwards. And, uh, but, but again, I think that, you know, you made it so easy and I think it's because of your enormous experience that you make these operations um, uh, possible through smaller incision. I, I, I never consider this easy because it's my uh, nightmare when I do herniation. But uh, we have to do it. <laughs> I, I must Thank say, you, Richard, yeah. Richard, uh, amazing, amazing uh, talk as always and, and um, great show piece there. I think Richard, I know for 20 years and over this time I've seen him so many cases that he makes so easy and look easy um, 
and he's got an excellent hand and I think good thinking and all that gets together and he's a very good teacher. So Thank I'm grateful, John. Richard, for uh, teaching us all, all over the last 20 years or so. Thank you, Therman. Okay. Anything else? I think there is not much of uh, questions in the chat box uh, for this lecture. I think uh, it's, probably I think it's, it has made clear. Okay, so we uh, just go the, to uh, uh, the multiple choice questions that we have. Zia, you want you want to take your questions close to your approach? Uh, so uh, uh, there's uh, question number one. I think I muted myself. Question number one. I, I listed a number of uh, procedures on the right side. Uh, all of these uh, procedures are intended to shorten the uh, posterior column, except for one. Uh, should I move to the next? Yeah, so, sorry, carry on. You just, uh, if you could just explain what is the answer and why. Uh, so the answer is thoracic laminectomy procedure does not shorten the posterior column. Everything else is does. Uh, if you have resective facets, you can apply compression and shorten the spinal column a little bit. If you do a ponte osteotomy, which is removal of the chevron osteotomy, essentially removal of the facets and the lamina uh, bilateral completely, uh, it is done when the discs are normal. Uh, and Simon and osteotomy, the same procedures in the presence of uh, ankylosing and spondylitis. And then you have um, pedicle subtraction osteotomy, which uh, shortens not only the posterior column, but also the interior column. Um, but the thoracic laminectomy procedure does not help uh, with shortening of the posterior column. So it does not contribute anything in terms of correction of the sagittal plane deformity. Uh, so these are a variety of posterior approaches uh, that we put here. Uh, and we briefly talked about that. And I think uh, Richard also covered some of this is which one of the posterior lateral thoracic approaches provide the best access ventral to the spinal cord. These are all dorsal approaches. Uh, so starting with the laminectomy, laminectomy with said resection, transpedicular approach, costal transversectomy approach and lateral extracavitary approach. Which one of these give you the best exposure ventral to the spinal cord? Uh, maybe you can answer that question. I don't know if you're covering the answers in every question, question by question. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. So the correct answer is here um, is a, a lateral extra cavitary approach. This allows you to remove significant amount of rib, at least six or seven centimeters all the way lateral to the rib angle. And that gives you the best um, exposure. It looks like the majority of the audience got the answer right. So. So most uh, thoracic intradural spinal cord, uh, spinal cord tumors can be approached posteriorly. Uh, the answer is, uh, um, I think we got 60% correct. Uh, yeah, the majority got this right. Majority of the cases can be approached uh, 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 ventrally. Very rare that we would do an anterior approach for intradural spinal cord tumor. Uh, so uh, I try to cover that during my talk, uh, which structure serves as a guide uh, to find the right plane dorsal to the great vessels. Uh, um, and you can see the majority of them, uh, the, the participants uh, uh, got this right. Uh, segmental or intercostal vessels are the ones that we use as a, <coughs> as a, as a guide. If you uh, stay dorsal to these structures, uh, typically it'll keep you out of trouble. Thank you. And that's all, sir. Okay, um, can we have everybody switch on their video? So we have a group photograph and um, Sandeep and Juti, maybe you can just wrap up the session and you know, we really thank uh, everybody. I think great discussion. I learned so much uh, during this session. Uh, Zia, you are great as always. Um, so uh, Sandeep and uh, yes. Juti. Oh, Richard. Richard and Zia, both of you, I, I really love the talk. So this was our fourth session and I think this one was the one which I liked the best. And uh, I really thank both of you.
So it was a great session, and I'm sure that the participants must have learned a lot from you. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you, certainly because, uh, yes, yeah, certainly because of the videos and the clarity of surgical procedure of a very tough subject. Uh, it's made very, very simple. Thank you for uh, both the speakers for doing extremely great job. Uh, Jaya and also Sasakar is extremely good. Uh, many times, you know, we get, uh, particularly the young neurosurgeons, they have a lot of ideas. Uh, the point which you made about the tomatosa and the point which you made from the endoscopic to microscope is extremely good. That's, that's what my feeling is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Sandeep. You want to just wrap up? Yep. So, so about the, have you prepared the slide for the next meeting? I think we have the slide for uh, pearls from the OR session. Um, Sandeep, you want to take this? Yeah, so uh, next we will be on we'll meet on 27th and 28th November, which will be the last part of our pearls from the OR sessions. So this time it is on cervical trauma and the uh, keynote speakers will be Richard Fessler, Zen Chan from China, and James, James and uh, Jocelyn Broch and Alex Vecaro. So see you on 27th. I think this is the pearls from the OR is only for members, right? That is correct, yeah. Yeah, so I would request everybody who is not a member to become the member as soon as possible to enjoy this meeting. Okay, see you all of you after 10 days. Oh, thank you so much, guys. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.